Welcome to The Bridge Online. No matter where you're worshiping from, we're so glad to have you with us. You're going to notice the stage is being renovated, so please bear with us as we make some updates to our sanctuary. With all that said, let's dive into the Word. If you have your Bibles this morning, go to Galatians chapter 5 as we continue our series on spiritual warfare. And today we're going to be talking about the flesh. If you remember, as we opened the series, we said that this spiritual warfare that we're engaged in takes place on three different fronts, three different enemies, if you will, kind of all in conjunction. They form an axis of spiritual evil. It's the devil, who we've been talking about the last couple of weeks, the flesh, and then, of course, the world. That is, those, those are the things that we fight on January the 6th, 1941, President Franklin D. Roosevelt shared his vision of the kind of world he wanted to see after the world war was over. He envisioned four basic freedoms that would be enjoyed by all people. The freedom of speech, freedom of worship, freedom from want, and the freedom from fear. And to some degree, uh, we here in America especially get the opportunity to experience those freedoms but there's a fifth freedom that we need and only Jesus Christ himself can give it. And that is the freedom from our sinful nature. I, I say it this way, you need to be free from yourself. Freedom from what is known as, what the scripture referred to as the flesh. And so again, in the last, in the last two weeks, we've talked about our enemy, the devil. And I think sometimes it's pretty easy to recognize that the, in, that the devil is our enemy. The scripture talks about him being an enemy, being an adversary, being like a roaring lion who seeks to devour whoever he can. And so it's pretty easy for us to identify that, yes, the devil is our enemy, but so few of us recognize this other enemy in our life, and that is our own flesh, our own human nature. The last few weeks, we've looked at scripture to gain intel right? Intelligence or understanding about the schemes of the devil and the tactics of the devil. And we've learned, hopefully from the scripture, how to overcome him. But, but the scripture gives the same type of intel when dealing with our own flesh, right? And so we want to look at the scripture in that same, with, that, with that same lens. Galatians chapter 5, starting at the 16th verse says, I say then, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lust against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another so that you do not do the things that you wish. I think we explained this a couple of weeks ago, but just to be very clear, when you are born again, the Holy Spirit comes and lives with inside of you. The Holy Spirit dwells within the believer. The Bible says that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so this scripture is referring to what happens after you are born again. There, there's a fight that begins to take place. And it's the fight for control over your life, over your decisions, over who you are as a human being. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit inside wants to lead you. The Holy Spirit wants to guide you. The Holy Spirit wants to lead you into places of fruitfulness and blessing peace, prosperity, growth, health. But the flesh is always there warring against that inner work of the Holy Spirit. And that's what this scripture is saying. Don't, don't be confused by the verbiage. That's what the word lust means. It means there's now a conflict between the Holy Spirit who dwells within you and your old sin nature. In, in, in fact, the word in the Greek for flesh here is actually sarx, S-A-R-X. And the word's unique as are a lot of Greek words, many Greek words, most Greek words have multiple meanings. And the word sarx can mean the material which humans are made of, you know, the, the actual, what we see with our eyes, the, the flesh, the human body. So sarx can be that. And sometimes in scripture it's used that way. But in this case, it's used to mean Man's being and attitude opposed to and in contradiction to God and his spirit. Taking notes, you can write that down again. 
It, it means when, when Paul uses the word sarx here in the flesh, flesh, it means man's being. It's, it's our attitude that is opposed to and in contradiction to God and his spirit. All of this started in Genesis, the third chapter. Now, I've referred to this story a couple of times. We're going to read it this morning. Go to Genesis chapter 3, and it all started long before you and I ever existed on the earth. It started with a man and woman named Adam and Eve, and you know the story, I'm sure, but let's read it. Let's just not assume everyone knows and understands, but not only that, we can re- the, the Word of God has authority and power. And I think maybe as, even as you read this, something will begin to settle in your heart. There'll be some revelation that'll begin to settle because this is where it all starts, folks. Genesis chapter three, starting at the first verse. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field, which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said, you shall not eat of every tree of the garden. Let's set the stage. The serpent is the devil, right? Adam and Eve are given the stewardship of the Garden of Eden, right? And everything in the garden is just perfect. It's right, okay? And and they have every provision that they could ever, ever need. And yet in the middle of the garden is this tree of the, the knowledge of good and evil. And it's there and it's in the middle of the garden. And God says, everything in this garden is yours to enjoy, to steward, to oversee. But one thing I'm telling you is leave the tree alone. That's it. Everything else is yours. Everything you need for provision, everything you need for shelter, everything you need is there. But there's this one tree, and I want you to leave it alone. Just stay away from it. And of course, the devil shows up and begins to question. We talked about this. He begins to challenge and question what God has said. And he says, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but the but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was pleasant to the eyes and a tree desirable to make one wise, She took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And so this is where it all begins. Adam and Eve were created and composed of sarks or flesh, natural flesh. They, They were not... Although they were created in the image of God, they were not as God. They were weak, right? They were a weaker vessel or weaker being as it is. They were in the flesh. But when they rebel against God, as we've just read about, what happens is in their weakness, in their flesh, there is a transferring that takes place. Their allegiance transfers, okay? Because up until this moment, their allegiance, their entire allegiance has been completely to God. There's no other allegiance. There's no other worship. There's no other, there's no other desire in their heart. They, are, they know instinctively because it's the way they were created to worship God. They know instinctively. It's within their DNA. They know they honor God. They know instinct. Just, it's, they didn't have to be taught. No pastors, no teachers, no Sunday school classes, no Bible. It was birthed within them from God, from the breath of God. I honor God. I serve God. I yield to God. God is my master. God is my savior, my ser- my, uh, the, the one that I serve, the one that I honor. It was instinctively in them. But on this, in this moment, when they choose to rebel and disobey God, 
they transfer their allegiance to someone else. The supremacy of God that ruled their life was now displaced by the supremacy of self. A self that is vulnerable to the influences of the devil and the world. Augustine said it well. Before the fall, Adam was able to not sin. But afterward, he was unable not to sin. Do you understand? In other words, up until this moment, there was an ability not to sin because there was no other influence in their life. And so they could live free of sin. Nothing else was influencing them. Nothing else was drawing their attention. Nothing else was vying for their devotion. Okay? But now at this moment, they open themselves up and they transfer their allegiance. And now they're unable to keep from sinning. In this moment in history, the powerful force of sin had captured Adam's thoughts and captured his desires, corrupting his nature and rendering him unwilling and unable to focus fully on the love of God and on the good of others. I guess the best way to explain it today is it's like someone that is enticed by a drug and they take it one time and one time is all it takes to become addicted. One time, and they're caught. Never thought they were gonna be caught. No one ever intended to wake up today and become a drug addict. No one ever ingested a drug and thought, I hope that, that by ingesting this, or taking this, or smoking this, that I will become an, addict, an, an addict to this thing. No one ever did that. And yet, you and I know, and some of us have been through these situations in our own life, that that the gravitational force, the pull of it brought us to a place where we were no longer able to control what it is that we do. And that's exactly what happened in the DNA of humanity thousands of years ago in the Garden of Eden. And from this moment forward, there would be a gravitational pull of this new fallen nature, or what we'll call this morning sinful desire. Sinful desire had entered in to the DNA of man. And like an incurable disease that passes from generation to generation, sin entered into and entrenched itself in Adam through the gateway of his flesh, and it reigns in all of his descendants until this very day. It's important for you and I to understand, folks, because it doesn't matter how well you were raised or how good of a human being you may be. This has nothing to do with your actions or or how you were raised or what church you attended. This This is who you are as a person, according to God. This is who you and I are, according to the holy and righteous standard of God himself. I love what J.I. Packer said. He said, if you have not learned about sin, then you cannot understand yourself, your your fellow man, the world you live in, or the Christian faith. Unfortunately, we have far far few Christians, far few churches and pastors who teach on the fallen state of humanity because it's just not very fun to teach about. Right? Who wants to come to church and hear about how miserable you are? Just instinctively, you're just miserable wretch. Like, who wants to hear that? But if you don't hear that, then you don't understand the enemy that you face. And it's like it's like we've talked about with the devil. If you just if you try to sugarcoat the devil and who he is and the schemes and the tactics that he uses. You're not helping yourself. You're hurting yourself because you're not identifying your enemy and how he works. Well, if you always live trying to make yourself look better and put on a veneer that that isn't reality, you're not helping yourself. And if I do that to you as a pastor and a Bible teacher, I'm not helping you. I'm actually hurting you. And so when you, when you pursue 
teachers and pastors that just tell you about how great you are, they're actually hindering you from knowing who your real enemy is and the nature of your real enemy. Now, as negative as this may sound, you have to understand that it all ends, like the story of Christianity ends with, a, with very good news. If you're new here this morning, this is the negative reality, but this is the reason that God sent his son, Jesus Christ, to come to the earth 2,000 years ago. He took on that, that weakness of the flesh that we all struggle with, and yet he lived a life that was perfect and without sin. And he took our sin nature upon his shoulders and he died on the cross. He shed his blood and he paid the penalty for our sin nature, amen? And so, so as negative, like if you don't know about the sin nature, is the story of Jesus really that good? Is it really? Like it's cool and it's intriguing that there was some guy 2,000 years ago that was willing to die for me. That's pretty cool to read about. But if you don't really understand how miserably wretched you are in your sin because of your DNA, because of just that's who you are, then, you know, it was just a cool story of a good guy who came and did some good deeds and he ultimately died for my sins. Yeah, that's great. But but when you begin to realize you were captivated and controlled and dominated by your sin nature, but Jesus came 2,000 years ago so you could be free, all of a sudden it starts to change your perspective. He came to set you free from this bondage of the flesh. Amen? Amen. And so you and I have to understand this morning that the flesh is the soil where individual sin grows. Now here's here's what's sometimes difficult for us to understand is that even though the Holy Spirit dwells within us, our sin nature still remains. There's still this pool that's there and we have to recognize it. And And as we just said, it's in the flesh, it's the flesh that that sin breeds and grows. The flesh, of course, includes the mind and the thought life as well. And and some would say today that that is where the greatest battle really takes place. Wouldn't you agree that the greatest battle that you and I face really isn't even with the devil? And although it is the flesh, it's not necessarily just the flesh, it's the mind And the mind is included in the flesh. It's unregenerate. It's unsaved. Your mind is not saved. Did you know that? Your mind is not. When Christ came and you received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, your mind didn't get saved. I wish it would have. But it didn't. And that's why the Bible tells you you need need to, you need to cleanse your mind with the reading and the washing of the word. You need to change your thought life. You you can't just think the way you want because if you just think unchallenged or unchanged by God's word, your sins are your or your thoughts are sinful and they will be sinful. That's the reality. It's because who you are, right? And so it's that's why the scripture calls you to be renewed in your mind and change your mind. That's why. That's why. It's important to be in God's word. It's the only way to renew your mind or change the way you think. Jesus describes this in Mark chapter seven. If you have your Bibles, turn there in Mark chapter seven, starting at the 20th verse. Listen to the way, this is a description of everything we're talking about from Christ. Mark chapter seven and verse 20. Jesus said, what comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, Foolishness, all these evil things 
come from within and defile a man. This is an exhaustive list, many, many other things, but, but Jesus is teaching. See, the Pharisees were, were teaching a false religion, that the things that you participate in that are external are, are the things that actually defile you internally. You know, and so they were, they were, they were putting this yoke of religion that if you walked too many steps on the Sabbath, that that defiled you and you weren't holy. That if you didn't bring the proper sacrifice or if you didn't eat the proper diet, right? If you ate something that wasn't approved by the Levitical law, that that defiled you, it was external and you took it in and and then it polluted you inwardly. If you didn't wash your hands, remember, I mean, you can remember these encounters that Jesus had. He said, you whitewashed walls. You're like, oh, you're doing so good at cleansing the outside of the vessel, but inside you are corrupt and full of dead man's bones. And so Jesus is teaching that corruption is within. It's, it's, it's who we are. It's our DNA. In this case, he's using it as the heart of a man. He's, uh, that's, he's talking about the flesh. And he's saying what defiles a man doesn't come from the outside in, It comes from the inside out. That's why the work of the Holy Spirit takes place on the inside. Jesus came and went right to the core of the issue. And Jesus and the Holy Spirit always want to go right to the core of the issue. They don't play games like we do. They want to go right to the issue, right to the heart, right to the core of the problem and fix the core. And that's why you have sometimes Christian young people or people that come to Christ and they give their heart to Jesus and they're sincere, right? And there's an inward work that takes place by faith, but then there's still some outside work that needs to be done. Are you with me? Why? Because it happens from the inside out. Yes, there should be some evidence at some point that there's been an inward change, but the, and the church messes this up all the time. Like we, you should dress this way. Like it doesn't matter. Like you can dress a pig up all day long, but it's still a pig. But if there's been an inward change, now there can be an external following, right? Things we begin to realize. Some stuff I need to cover up. Some, stem, some things I need to not show in the public. Some places I need not to go. There are things I need not to partake in. Like you start to learn that, but it's coming from an inward change. But Jesus is explaining that unless that inward change happens, you are bound by your own sin nature, right? It's, it's this, and he's teaching very clear. This is, this is where it all stems from. This is where it all comes. Now you got to stay with me. Okay. Stay with me because we're going to get into this a little bit more deeply. And if you're taking notes, you're going to just stay with me. Take something. Listen to this. The pool of the flesh works primarily through desire. Okay? Desire is not evil on its own. If you did not have a desire to eat, you would ultimately starve to death. Okay? If your body did not desire sleep because it was so tired, right, you would wear yourself out. That desire is not sinful in and of, in and of its own. In, in fact, you and I were created to desire. We're, we were created to desire that which is good. We were created to desire love. We were created to glorify God, which is a desire in our hearts. We, we want to glorify God. These are good desires. And, and so desire is not sinful on its own. However, desire becomes sinful when it becomes focused on selfish ends. Write that down. Desire is good on its own, but when it becomes focused on selfish ends, it now turns sinful. And the world and the devil work tirelessly 
to influence the flesh in this way. That's, that, that's, how, that's how the world and the devil works against our flesh. And you saw it in the story with Eve, right? If you, that's why we read the story. Eve's there. She knows the command of God. She has within her good desire. She's been obeying God. She's been honoring the Lord. She's been doing what she's created to do. But now she's faced with this moment where her eyes are taken off of God. And she looks on the tree and notice her good desires. Boy, the tree, look how pleasant. Does it remember? How it, the, that, that fruit looks really pleasant. What made that fruit look better than the other fruit? Like, did it, was it that, did it, did it have that much, was the color that much better? Was it big? What was it? Do you know what was attractive? It was the idea that I can do something apart from God and for myself. You understand? Read it again. Go back if you're taking notes. You can read it. The Bible says that Satan brought her to a place where she turned her attention to the forbidden tree, the forbidden fruit. And the Bible says that as she looked on it, it was pleasant. It was good. It was desirable. That there was that, why? It never was before. And we don't know how long. How long were they in? I don't know. But Many believe that they were in the garden. It was, could have been some time, like there could have been some serious time that Adam and Eve lived in the garden. We don't know. But certainly they had gone through life and they had seen this tree before. It wasn't desirable before. But all of a sudden today, because of the influence of Satan, it's desirable. And so there is a good desire that's being corrupted. Does that make sense? And, and so here, you've got to get this. You've got to get it before I can't, we can't move on because this is really, I think the climax of this portion of, of the flesh sermon, God has created us with desires. And in fact, think this morning, how much our desires that are good, that are based on God's word. Think about how many of how those actually enrich our lives. We, we have a lot of des- desires that enrich our lives. But far too often, we allow our desires to become twisted, corrupted, focused on indulging the, the flesh and not God. Listen to me, I'm, I'm teaching you where the core of the battle lies with your flesh. We... we Good desires that begin to be turned away from God and from the kingdom of God and from the benefit of others and begin to be turned toward ourselves. Now, here's something, write this down. When this happens, when we allow our good desire to be shifted away from God and others and toward ourselves, this is, this is what it's actually referred to in the Greek. The word is, and I don't know if I'm saying it wrong, so giggle if you want. Hedone, hedone, whatever, it's Greek. But that word, when that, that, that's what happens. When your desire goes away from God, from blessing and taking care of others, and to yourself, it becomes, the word that you're familiar with is, it's, it's where we get this word, hedonistic. How many of you have ever heard the word of hedonistic? You probably have all heard that, right? And that's what hedonistic actually means. It's it's the desire, it's it's this drive and this inward desire to fulfill what I want. That's what it means to be hedonistic. And so it's things like the desire for power, the desire for revenge, the desire for influence, the desire to be proud, the desire for greed, the desire for sexual pleasure outside of the context of the marriage relationship or the marriage covenant, the desire for food. Like those last two are great examples, right? Like it's good to desire food until you become a glutton. It's good to desire food until you just start the wrong type of food and polluting your temple. I know there's still some kids, so I don't know. 
Sexual desire is good as long as you're married. It's a gift from God. But guess what happens? It becomes hedonistic when we desire something outside of the context of a, of a covenant of marriage. It's now hedonistic. It's sinful. Amen? Does it make sense? But l- listen to this. In Luke chapter 8, verse 14, if they'll put it on the screen. Luke chapter 8 and verse 14. You may not think that this verse pertains to what we're talking about, but I'm going to show you it does. Listen to me. This verse is in the context of Jesus talking and teaching about the sowing of seed. Okay? And he talks about a farmer that sows seed. And some fall, you remember the story, some fall on good soil, some fall on stony soil and trodden down soil. Remember that? Okay. He later explains to his disciples that the seed that he's referring to is the word of God. And that the soil is how we receive his word. It's our hearts. It's, it's how we receive the word of God. And some of us have stony soil. It's hard. It's cold. It's indifferent. We just don't really care. All of this. Okay. Now listen to me. That's the context. He's talking about seed now. He says, now the ones that fell, the seed, the word of God that fell among the thorns are those, it's the soil who when they heard God's word, go out and are choked with cares, pleasures, and hedone. Cares, riches, and hedone are hedonistic. That's the word, pleasures. In the Greek is hedone, if I'm even saying it right. The word that we get hedonistic from. The hedonistic pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. You see it? Jesus says, and he warns us, that there are some who receive the word of God initially. They hear it. They they want the word of God to govern their life, to guide them, to live according to it, to follow it, not just to hear it, not to just sit in a church service and hear a sermon, but to hear God's word and respond in obedience and allow God's word to direct and guide their life. It appears that they're growing. It appears that they're receiving the word of God, but later it's revealed that they've allowed the cares and the pleasures of life to choke out God's word. In other words, they weren't led by the Holy Spirit, as we're told in the opening opening passage of scripture, be led by the spirit, don't be led by the flesh. And Jesus is teaching it. He said, there are going to be those who will hear the word of God. They're not, they're not, they're not agnostic. They'll tell you to your face they love God's word. They're not against church or against the Bible. They, they'll tell you they love the Bible. They'll tell you to your, they'll say, I want the word of God to guide me. But they haven't controlled their flesh and like weeds. Come on. Like weeds, they allow their fleshly desires to take over. And they're now led by the flesh. They say and they act and they look in many ways like they're letting the word of God lead them. But the reality is they're letting the pleasures of life or the hedonistic desires, that's the desire to satisfy the flesh, control their life. And and you'll know this because their life will bring no fruit. There's no evidence, there's no fruit that the word of God is governing their life. Does this make sense? Do you see it? And so, so when, when you go back to Galatians and you think, well, that's so difficult to understand. It's not difficult to understand. When the Bible commands us, Galatians chapter six, just go there really quick. I didn't, just go there. Back to Galatians chapter six where we started. When he says, walk in the spirit, you should not fulfill, fulfill the lust of the flesh, And then he goes on and it says it multiple times. Don't let the flesh control you. Let the spirit control you. Listen to me. Here's a way for you to remember this. He's saying, tend to your garden. Tend to your garden. Quit letting the weeds rise up and take control. Deal with the weeds. Deal with the garden. 
Let the Holy Spirit lead you. Let the word of God guide you. Quit letting your sinful desire and your sin nature have control. A person that allows their flesh or their sin nature to control them is like someone who has a garden that is overrun with weeds. Now listen, we can all be honest, you know this in Indiana, if you drive by someone's garden and it's overrun with weeds, you don't have a good feeling about that person. It's just in our blood. Something's wrong. They're lazy, they got issues, maybe they're sick. I don't know what's wrong, but you don't do that in Indiana. Amen? You know that. You driving by and having a good time, you say, look at that garden. Um, I would never do that in my garden. Come to my house, my garden doesn't look like that. It's tilled, it's hoed, everything's fine. It's, the rows are in great shape. When my father-in-law was alive, he was a master gardener, for real. He did, he did, he did an amazing garden. And he would do such a big garden that at that time he just, the whole church would get stuff. And so it was just clean and neat, no weeds. The rows were perfect. I mean, it was great. And there I was, I've never gardened. And then he passes away. So what am I gonna do to honor my father-in-law? I'm gonna grow a garden the next year in his garden spot. What's so funny? Well, the garden started, I tilled it well, and we planted it. And Charlotte was a part of this, and she should have known well better because she was raised with him. But by the time this stuff started to grow, the rows weren't very straight. I don't know what happened. They were kind of like this. And then I thought, this is no problem. I'll just stop by after work and just show that. And it was good for a while. And then it wasn't. Then before long... How many of you know we got to this time of year when it's hot and it's humid and weeds are thriving, right? And before long, I just said, forget it. And then you had to walk through the weeds to get a tomato and there may be one or two there. And it was embarrassing. It was embarrassing, so we never did it again. <laughs> it's work. What I'm telling you this morning is this doesn't sound very spiritual. I'm telling you that it's spiritual in its element, but in practice, it doesn't feel that, it's it's work. You've gotta take care of your garden. You've gotta take, you cannot let your flesh control you. Jesus came and gave you the key or the authority and the power within because of the Holy Spirit to control your flesh. I hear people say all the time, well, that's how I was raised. That's how I, yes, you're right. I just told you that. So the Bible tells you that. But you were never meant to remain in the bondage of your own flesh. You've been set free by the power, the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. That's why the Bible says that the same power that raised Jesus Christ out of the grave now dwells within your mortal body and you can say no to your fleshly desire. Somebody say amen. You can say no. You, you, can, you can say, I'm not doing it. I'm not going to let this impulse or this desire shift from something that's healthy and pure and natural from God to selfishness and self-focus. Go to James chapter one, we'll close. James chapter one, verse 12. All of this is summarized very well by James, extremely well. Listen to what he says. Starting at the 12th verse, first chapter, 12th verse, blessed is the man who endures temptation for when he has been approved, it means he's overcome successfully, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Now listen, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. Okay. When, when the, I've heard 
especially men, say, this sexual desire that I have is just natural. It's just, it's, it's, it's just in me. It's, and men will get around each other and say, that's just who we are. We're and, and, and there's, there's some measure of truth. Like there is, there's a sexual desire given to all of us. But, but you were not created like an animal to not have the ability to control it. Okay, for all the men in the room, I get it. Yes, there is. It's this, there's, there's this natural God-given sexual drive and desire that is within you. It's natural. But you're a man. You're not a dog. You're not a dog that's in heat or an animal that's in heat and you can't control yourself. You are, you are created in the image of Almighty God. You have the Holy Spirit dwelling within you. And you can control your sexual desire. Ladies, the same is true for you. And if you're a wife in the room and you try to use sex against your husband, that's a sin. You are tempting your husband to sin. The Bible speaks clearly against it. You're to, com- you're to, contem- or, or to uh, compliment each other, folks. That's, that's, that's the whole reason. So that, sec- that desire that's put inside of you can be properly controlled and enjoyed. Not just, just and enjoyed. It, it's what God desires for you. Okay, so he's explaining it. Now, he's saying when you're tempted, that's not coming from God. You're being tempted by the flesh, the world, the devil. There's, listen to what he says. You don't say that I'm tempted by God. God's, God doesn't tempt anyone. Verse 14 explains the whole process. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away. Drawn away from what? Drawn away from honoring God. Drawn away from serving others, drawn away from loving God and loving your neighbor, drawn away from the reason you're placed on the earth, drawn away and drawn to his own desires and enticed. Do you see this? It's exactly what happened in the garden, drawn away from fulfilling your purpose on the earth, loving God and loving others, drawn away and drawn to your own desire to to satisfy your own wants, your own needs, you're enticed. Now listen, then when desire has conceived, in other words, you've, you've, in, in the story of the Garden of Eden, she sees it's pleasurable and she's decided in her heart what she's going to do. Then it gives birth to sin, right? She commits the sin, she, she partakes of the, of the fruit. And then after sin, after the sin, it grows and develops now to where there's spiritual death. There's consequences. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. And and that is, of course, the totality of man, but it's still, that principle still applies to Christians. Folks, when, when you allow yourself and your desires to entice you, your unhealthy fleshly desires to draw you away from the purposes of God. And it draws you away so much so that you actually commit an act of sin. There are consequences still to your sin as a Christian. That's reality. You're not exempt from the consequences of sin. Like, I don't know. That's why the people that are like, oh yeah, you're still going to heaven. Okay, great. But I'd like to enjoy some time on earth until I get there. And we just tell people, oh, it's no big deal. You're going to go to heaven anyway. Yeah, live a miserable existence on earth dealing with the consequences of sin. Great. That's what we should be teaching in the church. No. You, you're experiencing a great deal of difficulty and death because you're not controlling your flesh. And you're reading. It's like that garden that's just, it's a mess. There's no enjoyment to it. And so folks, this, this, get this as we close. There is a deep-rooted desire in us to focus on ourselves. It's there. Every single one of us. 
There is a deep-rooted desire to focus on our own pleasure, to, to love and to trust ourselves and our feelings and our, the things that pull us and draw us. We, we, are, we are tempted to trust those things rather than to trust God. That's why most Christians have a very difficult time with what we would call the spiritual disciplines, prayer, fasting, giving. Let me ask you this. Do any of those things fulfill the desires of your flesh? Like how many got up today and thought, ah, I can't wait to fast. (sighs) I get to fast today. None of you. Why? Like, you might, until, for me, it's till like 10, 10.30 when I'm really spiritual. I can't wait to give my tithe this morning, 10% of my income, the first fruit as an offering to God. I can't wait to give my 10%. I get to keep 90% of what God has blessed me to be able to, to, to provide. But I, oh, I'm so thankful and so glad that I get to give my 10% this morning. How many of you woke up feeling that when you came in the room? Probably not a lot of you. It's a discipline. It's, it's, it's controlling the flesh. Your flesh wants to keep it all for yourself. The flesh wants to be full at all times, right? It's, it's, it's who we are. It's deeply rooted within each one of us. How many of you, you wake and you might, there's a desire inwardly to pray. And before long, your, your mind and even your body, you're just bored and you're drawn to every thought known to man, right? Because your flesh doesn't want to pray. That's why when Jesus is in the garden with Peter, James, and John, right before he's getting ready to die, he says, listen, fellas, you better pray. He said, Your spirit is willing. Your spirit has good desires, but your flesh is weak. Listen to me as we close. That's the words of Jesus. Your spirit is giving you good desires, but your flesh is weak. And you better determine who's going to lead your life. You better decide and make a commitment on who's going to lead your life. That's why today, as we listen, they come and sing. That's why today, things like this are so, this isn't just me on a soapbox, okay? And if this offends you, then I, I'm just gonna ask you to pray about it. But this is why things like this are so dangerous. They seem so innocent, but they're so dangerous. When people tell you and post, follow your heart. I'm telling you as your pastor, don't follow your heart. Do not follow your heart because Jesus said from the heart is where all this evil and idolatry and wickedness comes from. Do not follow your heart. Follow the Holy Spirit and the word of God. Listen, when when you're told follow your gut, don't follow your gut. Follow the Holy Spirit and the word of God. When you're told to live your truth, There is no such thing as your truth. You don't get to define what truth is. Follow the Holy Spirit and the word of God. That's where truth is. These are lies. These are schemes. These are tactics. It's the devil is great at stirring sinful desires. He knows they're instinctively there. And so he stirs them. And as one man said, listen, the devil is a master fisherman. He baits his hook according to the appetite of the fish. He's a master fisherman, and he knows just how to lure both you and I. Let's stand all over this building. Here's the reality as we close. You were not created to serve anyone, including yourself, other than God. Let me say it again. Stay with me. You were not created to serve anything or anyone, including your own self. You were created by God for God. You were created with a purpose to serve God. 
It's a high, it's the high, no other part of creation has this privilege, right? You, you were created to serve him and to worship him and to love him. And when you and I do that, it's in those seasons and those times that we experience the most joy. We experience the most contentment, the most fulfillment, the most peace. When we're controlling our sinful desires and we're allowing those desires to be turned to God and to his people. Let me close this way. Our desires this morning must be our servants, not our master. All over the building, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the intel from scripture. And yet, Lord, with all of the understanding, without your Holy Spirit, how can we live it? We'll learn more next week. But Lord, this morning, if there are those in this room that feel let no one leave disappointed, discouraged, but with an inner knowing that by the power of Christ and the power of the Holy Spirit that you give us, we can overcome. That we will overcome. That we'll walk in the victory that you came to give us 2,000 years ago. If you're in the room this morning, people are praying, eyes are closed, heads are bowed. If you're here this morning and you know that you've never put your faith fully in Jesus Christ, you may have prayed a prayer, you may have been baptized, you may have been sprinkled in water, you may have attended a church, but in your heart, you know, no one else, you know that you've never fully put your faith in Christ. You've never asked him for forgiveness of sins, you've never repented of your sins, which means you've never really turned away from them. But this morning, there's some inner desire, some draw, some longing that you want to. Now's your chance. People are praying, eyes are closed, heads are bowed. If that's you, and you want to give your life to Jesus Christ this morning, you want to be born again, and you're willing to repent, turn away from your sins, and follow Jesus, I want you to raise your hand. No eyes are looking. If you're in this room and you say, today's the day, Pastor Doug, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ today. Anyone in the room, on the floor, in the balcony, raise your hand high. Don't be ashamed. Don't be afraid. Anyone in this place. Praise God. Anyone else? Everyone, please keep praying. Young, young man, you, though you raise your hand this morning, just a simple prayer between you and Jesus. He saw your hand, that's probably even enough, but there's a, an inner call. The Bible says that if you'll call upon the name of the Lord, if you'll ask him this morning to forgive you of your sins, if you'll, if you'll say to him, I've sinned, I've fallen short, but I know you're the savior, I know you're the Messiah, will you forgive me, Jesus? The Bible says he will forgive you, he will cleanse you of your sin, he will transfer you from spiritual death and give you spiritual life. You'll be born again. So if you'll begin to pray this right now in your own way, Lord, forgive me, cleanse me. From this day forward, I choose to follow you. I choose to walk away from sin and I choose to follow you with your help. Everyone's praying, no one's looking. This morning, Young man, uh, if you prayed that prayer, will you just wave at me and let me know you prayed that prayer? Glory to God. Somebody give God praise in this house. No, come on, like you mean it. Yeah. Hallelujah.